Thank you very much for staying tuned to Development Focus with Gideon Joe on ITV. Today, 20th day of July 2022. Uh, like I said, when we opened the studio at 7 this morning, I did say something significant, something epochal happened over the weekend in the state of Oshun, and that's the last of the off-circle off-season governorship elections in Nigeria ahead of 2023 general elections. That election uh, uh, produced an upset, if you want to call it that, uh, in the sense that the incumbent governor of the state, Alaji Adigbo Egao Yutola, uh, was defeated by his arch rival, uh, uh, Senator Ademola Adeleke. It was an epic battle, a battle of the titans, a rematch of a sort, because <laughs> these two Dabatis personnel were actually, it, it was a good match four years ago on September 22, 2018, when they first had a political clash uh, in that governorship election, where uh, Alaji Boyega Oyetola won by a very small margin at the end of the exercise. And this time around, uh, uh, Jackson uh, Ademola Adeliki was able to exert his own pound of flesh by defeating the incumbent with over 28,000 votes. But we are not interested in the politics of that election. We are only interested in the processes and procedure uh, and what are the lessons we can learn from the Oshun governorship election. And indeed, all the previous of circle of season governorship elections that we have had since 2019. And I brought a political juggernaut, a, 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 an institu somebody with an institutional memory. Uh, this man, a perfect gentleman, has um, seen it or when it comes to election observation, uh, he's worked with different uh, national and international uh, non-governmental organizations in the last 17 years plus. And I'm talking here of uh, Paul James. Uh, Paul, and uh, then you, James, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, yeah, um, thanks for, the, uh, for honoring our invite. Um, so, uh, run us to your overall impression of uh, Oshun, July 16, 2022 governorship election. Uh, what went where? Well, what needs to be improved? Uh, overview. Yeah, so for me, Contrary to, I, see, I think um, Oshun surpassed a lot of expectations mm. from uh, both the political class, the election management body, and also citizens, uh, the way citizens engage the process. I, I'll start with INEP. INEP I, had a, I was apprehensive before the election because lessons of the past. I never could give you a good election in this election. You go to the next round of election, you see Wahala. If you recall <laughs> the FCT election that happened in our backyard here, uh, so 9.30 in the morning, several polling stations were polling in the yeah, You are referring to the Georgia, January, February, February 12, 12 uh, uh, FCT uh, area uh, council election. election. Yeah, so we went into AKT. I was a bit concerned that uh, for INEC, especially given the confidence question on INEC, but I never gave us a good election in the KT. And so going into Oshun, I had an apprehension. But then I'll start with the build up to the Oshun. I want to look at the Oshun from three lenses. One, the election administration. Two, the security. And three, citizens' participation. On the part of election administration, at Yaga, we deploy long term observers since March. Mm. And so I had the opportunity of visiting the state in March, in April, in May, in June. And then towards the end of June, I went to stay for. Well, two weeks to uh, superintend the process and also deploy observers. Mm -hmm. Now, from March, what we saw while we deploy long-term observers is the determination on the part of INEC to give the, good, uh, the people of Oshun a good election. Determination in the sense, we saw most of the things that INEC used to do in the past, INEC started them early. INEC had about a 14-point uh, checklist of items they needed to do.
So if you think about things like uh, engagement with stakeholders, those happen early, and INEC just opened the doors to almost everybody. Mm. INEC had a listening ear in Ocean, recruitment of ad hoc staff. One thing we saw that I think worked well for INEC was the training and retraining of ad hoc staff in Ocean, especially on the use of the beavers. Because mm. wh when we look at the election, talk about the election, you see how the process was almost seamless because of how the ad hoc staff managed the beavers. Now, also, let's not recall, or let's not forget that is, this is also the election that INEC introduced 750 more polling units, additional polling units in Ocean. INEC used to have, Ocean used to have 3,010 polling units. When INEC did the expansion uh, that happened in June last year, they added uh, 753 more polling units to the state. So this was the election that happened in 3,763 polling units. We raised concerns before then about the imbalance in voter distribution to the polling units because uh, you have some locations that have over a thousand voters, about 246 locations that have a thousand voters or more. There were eight locations in Ocean that had 2,000 voters or more and one location that had um, up to 3,000 voters on the register. So we were concerned about how that could affect election administration on election day. But then I'll talk about that later. Then on election uh, security, they were also concerned uh, coming into the election about the growing influence of cult groups in the states. Mm. Yeah, there is, uh, I, can't for, I can't remember the name now, but uh, somebody, Aniba and his, uh, Aniba, and the boys that were terrorizing the state. So you got places like in Ejibo, Elisha West, Elisha East, where our observers constantly, also we, over a, uh, the three months period, we released about five reports. And in each of the reports, the, the uh, dominant uh, issue from the report has been the concerns around insecurity and the, work, uh, the influence of the cult groups. They were gathering light arms and small weapons and also terrorizing people. In fact, there was something they called 77 in the state that scared us. Everybody was like, you have to be careful. Something usually happened. I think it's like an annual festival for the cult groups. Mm. So we kept alerting the police about those issues. And then um, the DIG that was in charge of the election, Kokumo, Johnson, Kokumo. Johnson Baba Tunde Kokumo, kept assuring us that they were going to do more pop exercise. In fact, two days of the election, we had a, a sit out with him where it also assured us that they had done those mop ups and they assured the people of the state that people were going to see a good election. Now, on the part of the citizens, also, um, one thing we saw in the build up to the election was that enthusiasm. If you recall when INEX started the CVR exercise, the online registration uh, on June 28, 2021, go back to the books and you see that Oshun was the state that did optimally well in that exercise. Over 700,000 people engaged the online process and over 300,000 uh, people in Oshun registered for the physical, did both online and the physical. So we went to the election with about 1,955,000 registered voters from about 1,600,000 that we had in the 2018 election. Now, another part is this uh, political parties. Whilst there was the engagement by political parties, I think they wanted to take the easy, easy route. Easy route in the sense um, we saw consistently in all our reports this monster now that is uh, ravaging the electoral process, voter inducement, in the sense of uh, what people may call at that point um, poverty alleviation or whatever coloration mm -hmm. people will want to give it because we will see people distributing food items beans, maize, rice, and the likes. Raw and food stuff. Raw food cooking. stuff. Raw food stuff. Yeah, okay. And then um, election happened around the season of the Ilea Festival. So they switched the game close to the election and started distributing, um, started distributing livestock. Mm. So um, the takeaway for me from this, there was, if you look at the statistics coming from that election, the participation was huge. Based on the PVC collected, 54%. Based on registered voters, 42%. So you may want to ask, what is the incentive? Two incentives for me from here. One is from the political class. Perhaps the voter inducement might have worked. Mm -hmm. But then on the other one is also on the part of INEC. 
given what INEC did in HET, that by 10 p.m. results from all 2,445 polynesians were uploaded, perhaps that was also what motivated a lot of people to go and engage the process. In Oshun, by 11, 12 midnight, all results from 3,763 polynesians have been uploaded. So I think kudos to the people of Oshun and INEC. They have given us a new narrative to election, a new template for which we will use as benchmark for measuring future elections. So I'm hoping that we build on that as we plan towards the 2023 and subsequent elections. Interesting. Interesting. So let's, that's, that's, that's the overview. Now let's drill down to uh, the usual suspect, uh, logistics. Um, usually what we experience on the field, because I was there in 2018, yeah. and uh, the NURTW will give all the assurances yeah. They will sign the uh, memorandum of understanding. They will pay them advance. And then on the morning of election, some of them will fail to turn up. Uh, what did INEC do this time around to be sure that, uh, at least from Yaga's report, about 76% yeah. uh, uh, of the police stations were open uh, between 7.30 and 8.30. Yeah. And by 930, 96, 96% or 97%. 96%. So, so I, I followed that too. So what did you think INEC was able to do uh, to ensure? Because this NURTW, even the Eniba guy, yeah. uh, is said to be a chieftain of the NURTW. Yeah. I think it was picked up on the eve, on of, the eve the of the election, election yes. uh, on the afternoon yeah. preceding the election. Yeah. Uh, so... Uh, w w what did you think? Because when I read that he was picked up, I thought that my anger is group from uh, even supporting INEC to uh, commute the uh, materials and personnel. But it seems it didn't happen that way. So what did INEC do? Or what do you think INEC do since you don't work for INEC? Yeah, <laughs> sure. The Eniba, I'll start with the Eniba and then I'll talk about INEC. I think as the people of Oshun came to realize that the guy was just working for his own selfish interest because he had vowed in some location that until he is sorted, that election will not happen, that until he was sorted by the APC and the PDP, he was very specific. Okay, so he, he was eating from both sides. From both sides. It, it's not as if he was being used by no. one against the other. He was eating from both. Mm. In a particular community, he vowed that until his, he had, and his boys are sorted, election will not hold. Mm. And then police on the other hand, or security on the other hand, vowed that they will, must, they will make sure he doesn't also participate in the election so the people of Oshun can have a good election. So. Mm. For all of us, uh, uh, like I was sincerely shocked when the news filtered in on Friday that he was picked because I thought he was very daring. Like, how can you be that bold? I don't know what was emboldening him that you come out and challenge an authority and say, until this happened, election will not hold. But on the part of INEC, I think we must go back also and look at the elections from AKT and also not forgetting the role of the traditional institution. Mm. In Ekiti, before the election, the Ewe of Ekiti, Ewe of Ado Ekiti, called a meeting with the National Union of Road Transport Workers, and there they all commit to ensuring early deployment of materials. So INEC used the same template. Um, a week before the election, the INEC chairman, Professor Mahmoud, came to town for two reasons. One, they came to, uh, test the uh, applicability of the beavers in the election, where they tested that in about 12 locations in three local governments in the state, and also to meet with the leadership of the National Union of Road Transport Workers. So perhaps um, he used the uh, AKT template, like I said, but perhaps also he appealed to the moral conscience to consider the state first and also ensure a hitch free uh, process. In AKT, uh, by 7.30 in the morning, 75% of location had INEC officials arrived. This was election that was supposed to start at 8 o'clock. Mm. And then 8.30 in, actually. 8.30 rather. In Oshun, by 7.30 in the morning, based on the report by our observers, in 78% of polling, this even was more than what we saw in the 2018 election. Mm. 2018 was 74, 75 there, but by 7.30 that officials had arrived. And like you rightly said, by 8 a.m., by 8.30 in the morning, our observers reported that in 41% of polling, the process was underway. Wow. By 9.30 in the morning, 
96 percent and by 10 100 percent of the locations had officials and materials and equipment on the uh, i mean conducting the process so i think is this um early preparation on the part of uh, early engagement like i said the meetings with the different stakeholders that played out in the election and then i saw also leadership on the part of INEC. I was in IFE Central, IFE East, and uh, IFE North, and then part of EDE. I met with the INEC chair who came on inspection in IFE Central. I was impressed. He came to inspect the non-sensitive materials, and there and then, after his inspection, he instructed the uh, staff of INEC there to start batching the materials according to polling unit, not even according to the, the racks, yeah. not even according to what, like start batching them by polling unit, so that once you, while you move them to what, they will be easy to transport to the polling unit. So I think it is also that determination, and before the election, I mean, INEC also committed itself. The resident electoral commissioner, Abdul Ghani Raji, Prof. 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 made a commitment as a stakeholder meeting that they were going to ensure everything is concluded within 12 hours. Mm. And they did. Yeah, but we also warned that, uh, we warned about cautious optimism that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't <laughs> be like, too sure. Don't be too sure until we Don't go in. They is. did. They delivered because if you recall also on election day, there were concerns from. I think a day is, if it is, uh, I can't remember the uh, collation center exactly. They were fracas at the collation center. They suspended collation. But uh, ANEC already have a backup copy of the results from the collection. So ANEC went ahead and announced the winner. When results were field training, we had concerns, especially when it was looking like a tie. We had concern that because 2018, it was the same location that delayed the process mm. uh, of collation on the first round of election. So we're concerned that what happened in 2018 might happen. happen. Yes, again. but then already, INEC assured that they had a backup copy of results from the location, and they went ahead and made the announcement and eventually declared the winner of the election. So I guess for me, it's about uh, what we saw was completely about early planning on the part of INEC and also meeting the right persons. The INEC chair showed leadership, like I said, by going into the state and interfacing with the National Union of Road Transport Workers. Perhaps that also worked in the election. Mm. Okay, so let's explore a little bit more about the role of traditional rulers in our electoral process. You did mention, <coughs> excuse me, you mentioned that the role a way of advocacy played mm -hmm. in the Kiti election. I also recall that uh, the Oba of Bini mm. uh, played a very key yeah. role when the scale of violence ahead of the 2020 governorship yeah. election was uh, on the high side. Yeah. He actually called them to his palace and warned all the political yeah. gladiators that they should not warn, they should not burn down the state mm. because of their ambition. And so uh, we have also seen people like Oni of FIFA mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, some other traditional rulers yeah. uh, play key role. So what, what do you think? Um, and then saying this against the background that some of the traditional rulers also stuck out their neck, mm -hmm. uh, open support for one against the other mm -hmm. of the candidate. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't want to mention here one of the traditional rulers that claim that he has instructed his community or his, his town to give uh, a party 90% or 90,000 votes. Yeah. And now uh, the party lost. Uh, how will you face yourself there? Yeah. <laughs> wait, yeah. wait. So uh, what, what do you think should be the role of traditional rulers, given this... Uh, should they be political or apolitical? Of course, the traditional institution is supposed to be apolitical, mm. especially when they truly understand that they are for all. The popular the saying... Fathers, uh, fathers of the state. The, of the yeah, sure. Mm. And what we saw in those, not just even uh, a do, uh, a do, even in Anambra, the last election, we saw the growing influence of the traditional institution now asserting their role uh, in the electoral process and the only of ife not also forgetting the the role played by the national peace committee in yeah, also yeah, yeah. We, we'll come to that in yeah, also, we, in we, also we, we are just looking at the key stakeholders yeah. because we still need to examine the utility or otherwise of this uh, peace accord yeah. that has become like and whether the time 
is suitable. <laughs> but let's look at the role of traditional Yeah, so the sports. point is, uh, for me, is about the platform that is also provided for these things to happen, for these things to happen in the public space where everybody will, uh, I mean, will be witness to a commitment to ensuring peace. We saw that with the uh, uh, above Benin, like you said. Uh, after even calling them to his palace, he detailed one of the senior aides to come to the meeting with the National Peace Committee and also the stakeholder meeting with INEC to get them to all commit to ensuring peace in the election. We saw that also in uh, played out in AKT last year. And then also um, this time around, only of Ife came for two meetings. In the first meeting with INEC and stakeholders, um, he spoke extensively in Yoruba. Uh, for some persons that were in the room, what they keep pointing us, oh, I mean, I just saw people nodding heads, people nodding, and then somebody whispered to me that he wished everybody in the room would understand what the only is saying in Yoruba because uh, he was speaking from the heart, but also saying things like, uh, it's about the state first and the state is bigger than everybody. And thankfully, before the end of the speech in Yoruba, he switched and to, English. to English and so... He was very specific and very direct about the need to ensure peace. So I think for me, uh, they are becoming, they are asserting their, their space, like I said, are becoming more influential. Now they all understand uh, this thing is at okay, I, I need to pause because we need to go on short commercial break. Uh, after that, you continue with your <laughs> line of thought. We need to make some money. <laughs> so a short commercial break and be back. Thank you very much. Um, we had to take that short commercial break. We are back. So um, you you were talking about the role of Oni uh, Ofife in the just conclusion of show election. How he spoke uh, from the heart yeah. and then um, he switched to English. Yeah. So what what effect did that have on the people at the stakeholders meeting? Of course, not only on the people. That was also a program that was broadcast on almost every medium in the state. Wow. Yeah, both pre, uh, um, the electronic, electronic medium, radio, media, and TV. radio and TV. So I think the message went as far as it was expected to go. Uh, this is also because if you go to other elections, I'm glad you mentioned uh, a do election, on do election, a do election based on our pre-election findings. 12 of the 18 local governments were riddled with different forms of pre-election violence. Mm. In Ondo, 13 of the 18. Ondo was a state. One thing that I uh, always I always remember is about a, a, a woman that was stripped naked. She was so ignorant. She was wearing one party apparel up, one down. Wow. They stripped her naked, embarrassed her in the public. And so with those sort of fears, because like I keep saying, what I think politicians are beginning to do now, they are not only weaponizing poverty, they are now beginning to weaponize violence. Mm -hmm. If you throw violence out in the ring, people get scared, people don't come out to vote. And if people don't come out to vote, they go about manipulating the process. Now we are seeing a bit of reduction in this violence around election because they now understand they need those people to go and vote. Mm. If people are based on the new electoral act now, you need the physical body to go and vote. Otherwise, it's also a waste. You can't go and start uh, inflating votes, which I never will later cancel. So, <coughs> those are the things we saw in the other elections coming into this election. We promoted violence and that. And so, that was why I thought the influence of the traditional institution there was very, very timely and then. Uh, it was just what people needed. The extension we saw this time is that almost every of the uh, um, TV and radio stations, like I said, were in the two rooms, and then the, some of them broadcast live, and I think it helped. It helped in assuaging people that um, there was commitment on the part of the, uh, of the traditional, uh, of the political class. Not only that, in the first meeting with INEC in uh, Oshun, the IGP of police was there in the meeting. In the second meeting that happened during the uh, signing of the peace accord, the DIG Kokuma was in the room. And both of them, both of them, uh, for, forget, uh, forgive the use of the word, both of them were very brutal about how they are going to enforce mm. or ensure yes, a violent yes. free process okay. in the So, so let's look at the role of peace accord. Uh, it has been institutionalized for like about 10 years now. Uh, 12 years actually from 2011 mm -hmm. i think it was uh, started um after the 20 
Yes, by 2010, 2011, mm -hmm. uh, we've been having signing of peace accord. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people said, oh, why don't we sign this peace accord like a month or two mm. or three months mm. to the election so that it will have the desired impact. Yeah. That when you are signing peace accords 48 hours or 72 hours to the election, the deed and damage may have been done yeah. during the campaigns. Yeah. So what's your take? What, how, how useful is this signing of peace accord um, routinely now in, uh, ahead of our elections? I think sometimes I also share in that view, as a, not just the peace accord, even on the part of the security. Sometimes you do all of this security mapping before election, you share reports with the security. You don't, they don't seem to act until the week of the election. They come in and they begin to do what they call show of force. Show of force. Yeah, yeah, so sometimes I also imagine if this will have happened early, would that have impacted on voter turnout in the election? For instance, Anambra is a case in point. But whatever it is, um, for all intent and purpose, I think the peace accord is also serving the objective, uh, the, the objective that it set out to do, mm. especially close to the election. There was that call in Oshun, in the hall in Oshun, uh, with the, uh, where, while the ceremony happened, someone actually made a call, made the appeal whether that could have, have also have happened earlier. So I guess they will go back and reconsider that, not also forgetting that initially this idea of peace accord was just for national election. Yeah, sure. That was uh, way back. Yeah. Exactly. It was for national election 2011, 2015, and 2019. Yes, yes. So from the 2020 election, uh, Edo election, because of, uh, of course, what people saw in the build-up to the election, there was a call to the Peace Committee to consider also stepping into Oshun, to so start that from the Oshun. And so, um, of course, they got support through the EUS, the GN, and their partners and were able to execute that from Oshun. When, uh, from Edo rather, when Edo was a success in uh, September thereabout, they also transitioned from uh, uh, there to Ondo and Ondo, Anambra, Anambra, and now we are AKT and Oshun. So this is like the five governorship election where that has happened. We hope that that will be domesticated. That will become like a new normal as we go into other elections. But beyond that, also, like you have suggested, and others have also suggested that this should also be happening early, maybe like two months before the election, and then come back also close to the election to reassess whether people committed to the spirit and latter of the then, accord. Then, uh, is it not also worthy of exploring the interface between the National Peace Committee and the Interagency Consultative Committee on Election Security? Shouldn't they be working harmoniously together? Um, because we, we don't seem to, I don't know whether I'm, I'm, I'm right on this, but we don't seem to see much of the impact of ISIS, the Interagency Consulting <laughs> Committee on Election <laughs> Security. Uh, we don't seem to see that. Uh, or is that the way it's designed, that they should just work behind the scene? I feel that maybe if they interface, mm with the National Peace Committee, yeah. it will form a robust... I'm not saying that the National Peace Committee should be integrated mm. into ISIS. Yeah. I'm only saying that in terms of uh, sharing information and, you know, maybe meeting with the key stakeholders mm -hmm. ahead of elections. Um, for instance, uh, there is a backroom uh, back room or back, back door, channel, back channel advocacy, advocacy and yeah. diplomacy beyond yeah. the signing of peace yeah. accord. Sometimes this MPC yeah. peace committee will go meet the political yeah. gladiators yeah. behind the scene, yeah. appeal to them, talk to them, yeah. and all of that. And that's why I feel if they if they can have a, a working alliance with ISIS, uh, um, and then the, the, this may actually be more impactful. Uh, yeah. to ensure peaceful elections. Yeah, so um, there has been called not just to expand access to include MPC, but even, uh, even CSOs. This is also from the point that sometimes you feel like the ISS is not doing much. And that is because most of these institutions have become territorial, territorial in their defense in the sense 
if you go to INEC and you lay some complaints to INEC, INEC will begin to tell you this is not a, this is where the remit within which we can operate. That is for security. If you go to if you talk about, for instance, uh, prosecution of electoral offenders, if you go to security, they will tell you if INEC does not report ABC to us, of course we cannot act. INEC will not tell you we uh, will tell you we cannot arrest only the security can. So sometimes we get confused. Who is supposed to be doing what? All of these security concerns, you have agencies like, you know, election observation is observing any aspects of the electoral process. Mm -hmm. Some persons' interest will be, for instance, um, women, violence against women in election. Some will even be about election policing and all of that. People are getting reports from all of this and sharing with st uh, stakeholders like security. Sometimes you get frustrated whether they're using your reports well, or when not. When you get all these uh, reports of your mapping exercise, yeah. Or you work, uh, Clean Foundation yeah. uh, gets its own uh, security threat assessment. And they just submit it. Should they be submitting to INEC or to the ISIS? We, I, I for what we, that's exactly why I say sometimes you feel like that opportunity should be there, or expand it and include so other that stakeholders. When CSOs are there, they can say, yeah. this is Yaga, this is uh, World exactly. Situation Room. This is what CDG, exactly. this is what Clean Foundation uh, is saying. I was on a national TV with, uh, that was during the Edo election. In fact, I didn't even know I was on, I was sitting with a DIG and was talking about all the security issues from Edo before the election. And there and then the DIG was like, yes, they corroborated whatever we had said. Those were also places they consider hotspot and that he will confirm on national TV that they were using our reports for their own security mapping. But sometimes you also need this feedback to even have come to you, so it will also give you confidence that somebody yeah, is appreciating. You are making, impact, you are making yeah. impact. So it was on national TV that I got that from a DIG that, of course, they've been getting a report. But then beyond that also, about the backdoor advocacy, all of us do that. All of us do that. For us at Yaga, when we, we three months of the election, we go on what we call advocacy visits to engage with the police, with all the leadership of the security agencies and as well as uh, the INRX in the state. From that, we open up the door for communication. Sometimes even as uh, text messages, we send text messages with, uh, with uh, these uh, people, but it's just about how they act. Most times they leave it, it is uh, more like they, an episodic. They are episodic, not proactive. They more like more an episodic, reactive. More reactive, mm. more like an episodic engagement. So you get worried, you get concerned. I know the peace accord, before I even, I packed the peace accord a symbolic ceremony because I know a lot of things that happened. I have been privy to information about a lot of things that happened in, uh, on the background before the main ceremony happened. Most of them, like in Oshun, we saw on live TV where most of them were uh, speaking and uh, the candidates, all the uh, uh, 15 candidates were speaking and making commitment to ensuring a peaceful election. That tells you that there was a prior engagement mm. before the main signing of the ceremony. So if those things are happening and people are, they are, we are getting this information, the p information is public way ahead of election, my sense is it will help in inspiring confidence about the process and also help in increasing participation in the election. Okay, uh, away from the peace accord and the role of traditional rulers, let's look at Oshun vis-a-vis -vis PWD. Uh, this is the second election uh, after the signing of the electoral 2022 on February 25, 2022. So, um, on a comparative note, how much of uh, things, how, how much change, uh, positive change, uh, have come the way of uh, persons with disabilities? Uh, was I not able to provide? Because I have I had uh, a foster Grace Jerry, yeah. uh, where you are seated. Uh, Two, two weeks ago, mm -hmm. two or three weeks ago, and uh, I asked her about the preparation for show and general elections. And she told me that um, some of the, your checklist uh, is yeah. also containing uh, watching out for yeah. the PWD yeah. and all of that. So what have you to say about how INEC is taking uh, the issue of PWD seriously, particularly now that it's mandatory for the Commission to provide those assistive materials. So I'm glad you mentioned Grace Jerry and we uh, collaborated both on the Kitty and Ocean and uh, shared the same checklist. And I saw some pictures she posted from the Ocean election, which 
was a confirmation that INEC has improved, especially in uh, ensuring a, an inclusive process. For the ocean election, INEC recruited hard hoc staff that also have some disabilities. Oh, interesting. Yes. That's very good. Yeah. Uh, they tried to mainstream them into their engagement. I think about 35 or there about ad hoc staff that have disabilities. And so, uh, which is a start, a good step in the Very right good direction. Start. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and you know, the National Disability Act says 5% mm. of recruitment yeah. or employment should be. Uh, yeah. for so that is from the recruitment of persons with disability. Yeah. And that's also the deliberate attempt now to provide assistive aids for persons with disability. Mm. We saw brain ballot guides. We saw magnifying. In fact, there is a, a picture of someone with, that is making a, someone with albino, albinism that is using that use magnifying glass to try to project um, the ballot paper, ballot paper, and list of uh, registered voters that was posted on the wall. So we saw uh, magnifying glasses and also the PWD poster, the one that was posted on the wall that yeah. provide guide about how they should engage in the election day written instructions. Exa for exactly. And then there is also the form EC40H, which is for statistics of persons with disability. Those were available both at the polling unit level and also at the local, because we observe both polling at the local government collection center. So we saw um, that in both locations and also to a large extent, our HANEC have also tried to um, use that in the administration of the election. But then, another concern that still remains is also about access to polling units, which likely is also not uh, in the domain of INEC. Yeah, because of uh, th those uh, public structures. Yeah, think? public structures. Yeah. So, based on our report, the Aga Africa's report for Oshun, we have about 28% of the locations where we thought people have to climb some steps to access the polling units, which makes uh, participation difficult for persons with disabilities. Particularly people on crutches yes. and uh, wheelchairs. Exactly, exactly. So I think that is where the problem still remains about access to polling units. But on the part of INEC, the Commission has tried in both elections, especially they even did better in Oshun to ensure the inclusion of people with disabilities. Okay, uh, let's come to the big monster, voter inducement. Um, that, that was more like a recording decimal across all the um, uh, observer reports that yeah. I've seen from CLIM to CDD yeah. to Situation yeah. Room to Yaga, Africa. Uh, all of you flagged that issue of voter inducement. Yeah. And um, what, what are your thoughts? First, let's examine what did you see on the field? What did your observers report to you? Is there a new device to, apart from the nomenclature, you know, stomach infrastructure, mm -hmm. see and buy, the Boweko Sebe, uh, family support, yeah. and all of that, <laughs> that they call it. <laughs> apart from the branding, what was unique with this year's uh, Oshun election in terms of voter inducement? Let me give you an instance. In, in 2018, I saw that people are collecting tallies to go and get their money. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> when, you, when they see where you yeah, voted, yeah. either through your the, uh, mm. the phone, mm. and you, you will snap the yeah. picture of how, how you voted, you show to the agent, the agent gives you a tally, yeah. you go elsewhere, mm. outside the precinct of the polling unit, yeah. to get your pay. In, in another place, I saw that they were just taking names and account numbers to be paid <laughs> to be paid later yeah. so the, the, the very ingenious ways mm -hmm. that you know political gladiators are engaging in voter inducement so what what was different i wasn't on the field this time yeah around. so before i go to <laughs> even this i want to just cast my mind back to um i think the edo election in 2014 Okay, yeah. Yes, I was in the field for that election. I saw something interesting. I saw an ambulance. <laughs> ambulance? I saw ambulance. And the po police stopped the ambulance. These guys were shouting at the police and they were taking the emergency to the hospital. Police <laughs> insisted, open the ambulance. Let's see what is in your ambulance. They opened the ambulance. They saw political talks and they saw money that the talks wanted to use for inducement. Yeah. So politicians will, call, will always come with different means. <laughs> to beat the process. But what we saw in Oshun mm. is some places where that 
We saw vehicles that were positioned strategically. This is also an election that the police told us the eve of the election that movement will be restricted from 12 midnight until 5 p.m. of the previous days. But how some of these cars got to the polling unit, we wonder. So they were strategically positioned and also based on our data in 34 percent of polling units the party agents were positioned in a way that they could see how people were marking their ballots mm. so so if, there's a bit of secrecy of ballot exactly so if the party agents see how people mark their ballot they signal the person that is on the other end and yeah. then okay pay him or pay yes her. yeah uh, see and buy they call it okay see and buy and to some extent also we had questioned how some of these voting cubicles were positioned. In 7% of polling, they were not also positioned in the location that allowed the secrecy of the ballot. Some voters deliberately, before they, uh, they drop their ballot papers in the ballot box, they will want to flash it so that the other party will see and then they turn around to go collect whatever. Yes, but then, like I said earlier, let us not limit vote buying to just election day. Yeah, if, yeah, of course. Even the section 121, and section 127 of the Electoral Act yeah. uh, criminalized voter inducement even before. Exactly. Like, even issue around uh, making promises of employment, mm -hmm. uh, giving food, mm -hmm. food stuff, yeah. uh, souvenirs, yeah. and, uh, contracts, mm -hmm. appointments, all of that constitute vote, yeah. voter inducement. Yeah. And they are criminalized by our electoral act mm. even 2010 electoral act in section 124 and section 130 and now the current one section 121 and section 127 mm -hmm. criminalize this and the uh, penalty is 12 months imprisonment yeah. Yeah. or 500,000 fine yeah. or both, both depending on them uh, so so this this issue of breaching of secrecy of ballot and then uh, to encourage to to be able to induce voters so yeah. Um, how much were, was your, were your observers able to get that people were getting paid uh, for their votes? People were paid between 2,000, 5,000, in some places 7,000. Depending on, what, on whether it's opposition stronghold yes, and all of that. Based them. on what we gather. Some got 2,000, some got 4,000, some got 5, some So it's got not seven. a uniform across. It wasn't, it wasn't, it's not it, like a deregulated no, fair it price. No, it wasn't a uniform <laughs> thing. But then also, uh, it, I think it to be uh, important to also highlight the, import, uh, the role of the security agencies here. Because we saw a marked improvement over what we saw in AKT. AKT, I think it was, a, uh, 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 for lack of a better word, maybe a culture shock for some of the security agencies. When observers will approach them and say, hey, vote buying is happening, and you, didn't, you did not arrest, and they will tell you what you want me to do. In AKT, the police said they set up uh, electoral offenses deaths. The same also in Ocean. But in AKT, what we saw more was um, the ICPC and EFCC making arrests. But this time in Oshun, I think we saw even uh, we saw clips of places where even the police made arrests. So I mean, we give them credit where where, where they deserve okay. the credit. So they did well so, in Nigeria. So, so in your own estimation, how do we uh, how can we cope this growing monster of voter inducement? I think it to uh, uh, it's just to deliberately infuse it in a voter education. Because some of these things are happening out of ignorance. The person collecting the money or the inducement does not even know that, doesn't care to know that um, if he or she is caught, he or she is also liable for, to be prosecuted. For some of them, they think it's election time. Election time is harvest time. When they give me, I collect. I will not see them until after four. If I, it was even sad, what we had decided to add to our engagement is community mobilization before the election. We did that in AKT, also did that in Oshun. In AKT, you hear people tell you, for instance, I mean, there are places that we were almost chased because some persons thought we were politicians. An old woman was like, oh, so you people have come again, we'll not see you until after another four years. So it is sad that this is becoming a reality, that um, people are relying on these payouts every four years. So if we will all infuse it in our voter education engagements, that as we engage people, not to wait until very close to the election, but beginning now, as we plan towards 2023, we'll begin to tell people about the evil of uh, vote buying and that people 
anybody that is caught in that ad, per, the person is liable to be prosecuted. Perhaps that will help to reduce it. Uh, do you also support the idea of having this um, uh, this um, uh, security agents doing this as a sting operation or covert operation, uh, wearing body cameras and uh, you know also having mobile courts you know on standby to prosecute uh, like uh, environmental sanitation <laughs> <laughs> offenders <laughs> where the mobile courts uh, are there to pass their sentence. Uh, it's, it's very straightforward, 500,000 mm. fine or 12 months imprisonment or both uh, if you are caught. So if you have body cameras and they are filmed uh, your offenses and that is reviewed by the judge and there is a lot of uh, hype around those who have been prosecuted. Because from 20, I mean, you are the one on the field. Mm. Uh, I'm usually, whether in the studio or yeah. you know, monitoring. So uh, how many people in the last three years uh, had been prosecuted for electoral offenses since 2019? Definitely, a very big question because we have raised that concern as well. When police mentioned to us, I, I, I am specific about them because they are the lead agency for election. When they mentioned to us in HET that they had set up an electoral offenses desk, beyond setting up electoral offenses desk, we also raised concerns about how to even identify uh, the genuine uh, security official that will be on the field, given the lessons we saw from Koji and other elections yeah. where we had fake officials, uh, security personnel that were deployed. And so the police on the spy said there were supposed to be some tags that we'll see and they're supposed to also have their own accreditation. There were concerns going after the election that people didn't see much of uh, a public display of how to identify the genuine security. We went into Oshun. We raise that concern as well. But then, beyond that, like I keep saying, I think it's even to change the approach. How many people will you want to ad ad arrest, given that some people are doing this out of ignorance? Can we change it from being uh, reactive to preventive? Because that is the attitude. If a lot of if people are, are educated about this and also understand the value of their vote, perhaps it will help to reduce that. Not also forgetting, even in this election, there are people that actually went out and resisted vote buying. We saw that in Anambra. We saw that in Ekiti. We also saw that in Oshun. There were locations where people resisted vote buying. And then for people that are voting, uh, engaged in that process, they will tell you, for instance, I will collect the money and vote my conscience. I'll tell you your conscience is dead if you collect the money. If you have the conscience in the first place, you will not even engage in vote buying. Okay. Let's, let's do, because we need to, we are winding down gradually on this segment. Uh, let's look at um, um, someone flagged the issue of fake observers. Uh, did you see that on the field in Oshun uh, that there are unaccredited observers or with bogus uh, badges that are not customized? Did you pick up that in uh, in Oshun at all? I didn't see any, uh, and none was reported to me by any of our observers, but also this goes back to also INEC about the need, uh, the need for um, INEC to ensure due diligence in accreditation of observers because sometimes this is like having clean water and then you put a drop of uh, any bad element in the water and then it soils everything. We have seen in previous elections where you have the genuine observer groups going one direction and one group is saying something contrary to what has happened. Perhaps because of the way both elections went in the GTI and Oshun and the resounding success from the two elections, we have not had any contrary opinion to the election and that is why we didn't see so much of this fake observers, but I think INEC, we need to go back to INEC drawing board and say they need to do due diligence in the engagement. As much as we want to ensure an open process, an inclusive process, it's not just everybody that you allow to get into the field, given also how sensitive election and election observation is becoming. Okay, so let's use the next two, three minutes to look at, um, th we have finished the off circle, off season governorship election. So we are preparing for 2023 now. <coughs> Given all the experiences Yaga has acquired over the last uh, 15 years now, 
and um, in the from 2019 to date, way forward for 2023, what will that be for each of the critical stakeholders, for INEC, for political parties, for candidates, for civil society, for media, and security agencies? So can we use the next two, three minutes to... I think for me, the new electoral art have made the job even easy by half. One is about the need for early planning on the part of INEC. Because as INEC begins to plan early, it behoves also that other stakeholders kick, uh, uh, jump in and also start planning early. INEC has started that already. But beyond that also is about the constitution of the election body. As we speak or as we know, the tenure of about 20 or there about the electoral, electoral commissioner will expire at the end of the month. About 11, I think tenure of about 11 has expired already. That there will be need. You got over uh, less than 230 or there about this to the next election. There is a need <coughs> to start that engagement process. There is a need to start the recruitment process now so that these people will be part of the planning towards the election. One of the things we had raised also, uh, and <coughs> I have tried to expand access to polling units. Good approach. That has solved a political problem, a political decision of providing access to people but it has not solved a logistic problem. We still have location. So let, let, let me pause you. We need to go on another short commercial break. After that, you continue and wrap up uh, on your thoughts for, you know, 2023. Uh, we'll be back shortly. Uh, let's take a short commercial break now. So, <laughs> final words. You, 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 you have... You are saying something about INEC. Yes. What INEC needs to INEC do. INEC has started engagement already. One year to the election, timeline, all of that is out. Voter registration is part of all of the planning. The other part, based on the new law, is about uh, the financial independence of INEC, releasing funds for the election early for INEC. I hope that has been done or there is a planning towards that, because that was part of the challenge we had. Yeah, for the, uh, uh, the section 20. 3 sub 3 of the electoral yes. Yes. Another point I had mentioned is on the part of election administration. I now created more polling units last year, 176,000 new polling units. I now need to go back to re uh, uh, review uh, the whole process, and um, especially locations that still have more than the threshold of 750, and see how they can reallocate voters to the location. With this new interest we are seeing, especially on the part of young people to participate in the process, if INEC have a surge in voter turnout on election day, I wouldn't know how they will manage the process in some of the locations. Even in Oshun that we are celebrating, there were locations that had high turnout, the election stretched into the night. And yeah, I, in night there are so one yes, police, yes. police. and it's not something you will want to encourage. But on the part of the uh, CSOs as well, the need for early voter education. Let's not make it episodic and wait until January or February of 2023 to start looking for these voters. Now that the interest is still wrong. Our funders also need to be aware that they we know need to already. start early. This is, so, because this if is the money the, is not available... This is one of the biggest elections. They say if Nigeria sneezes, <laughs> they, <laughs> all they, work at they are already here. Some of them are here already. Some of them were in Oshun and AKT. I think they understand the need for this early planning. Some of them met with Anek yesterday, and Anek told them they are already working towards 2023. I hope we all take a lesson from that and also provide the needed resources for people to engage. A anyway, I, I know this is an ongoing conversation. <laughs> the much you have said is noted. <laughs> All of us ask, must be on deck. And funding for security also yeah. must be timely because yeah. they need the money. Funding and also meetings. That was something they had introduced in Anambra, in AKT, in Osho, meeting with CSOs before the election. I think we should make it a regular meeting, like even once in a month before the election, meet and ask about what people are interface seeing and how you can interface and see how that can help them in their security planning. Okay. Thank you very much, Paul James, for coming on the show. It's been a very elucidating and didactic session with you. As the man with a lot of institutional memory, he can recall figures from <laughs> 17 years ago when he joined the, the fray of development workers. Thank you very much. You, I, I wish appreciate. you the best of luck. Thank and uh, regards to uh, the management and staff of uh, Yaga Africa. I uh, keep up the good work you're doing. And uh, of course, um, your reward is here, not, <laughs> not in heaven. It's here or not. 
uh, we, we hope uh, at the end of 2023 election, we'll have cause to celebrate. Oh, definitely. Okay. So that will be the size of this segment. But don't go anywhere. Uh, in a bit, we'll be back to review the NBA election. Today is election all through. <laughs> NBA had its national election. What are the lessons for INEC, for civil society? And what is the agenda for the new executive? That's what we'll be doing in a bit. My, my regard, the top is already uh, somewhere in the corner to come and tell us how we should learn from them. Uh, please stay tuned and stay blessed.